Yes, great. So thank you for being here today at this very first uh, JavaScript conference in Ireland. So today I'm going to talk to you about something that might be pretty new or maybe it's not for you. It really depends. Um, but every new front-end project I start, I usually start by checking out the APIs. What kind of APIs do we have and how I'm going to work with this and how will my data flow be? And usually it will start something like this. I'm start asking for GraphQL APIs. And not all projects have them. So in the end, you find out either your product manager or maybe the one giving you the assignment or maybe someone else is saying, yeah, we already have the REST API or a certain database. So we don't have any resources to create your GraphQL API. So it always makes it pretty hard for me to start a new project and always makes me think, what should I do to fix this problem? How can I find a solution to this? So let me tell a little bit about myself first. So my name is Roy, I'm from Amsterdam. So I just flew in here yesterday and I was kind of surprised by the weather, which is really nice by the way. I heard it wasn't normal to have sun over here. <laughs> so I was really happy with it. It was really hard to find a place to sit outside in the sun although, but yeah, I managed. So most of my time I spend on working for the city of Amsterdam, where we work on open source projects, and mostly JavaScript, but also Python, that either are providing for people living in Amsterdam or either for people that work for the city of Amsterdam as well. So we're making all these projects for them. I also teach React and GraphQL. Uh, I have some startups that I co-founded and I'm an ambassador for OutZero. So I'm pretty busy most of my times. But I also work on projects. And like I said before, some projects don't have REST, API, have REST APIs and maybe not GraphQL APIs. And one thing I really like are GraphQL APIs. So suppose you work on a new project. It has some standard database, it has a REST API, uh, it uses JavaScript, and it uses something we saw in a previous talk and which I also really like, React. And if you're maybe, if, probably you're all familiar with REST APIs, right? I take that as a yes. But are you familiar with GraphQL APIs as well? Who did? Uh, okay, so a lot of you, that's great. So let's first look at the REST API for those of you that don't know what a REST API is, or those of you that have been using GraphQL so much that I forgot what it was. So REST APIs have multiple endpoints. And this is one of the, the basic things that the REST API has, so the basic endpoints. And if you would look at the project I just proposed to you, so this could be maybe an e-commerce shop, or maybe it's somewhere else where you can buy products, it could be a marketplace, uh, let's suppose it's an e-commerce shop, maybe a very big one that everyone knows. So it will have a REST API. And it also has UI, which you can see on the left, and a REST API, some example endpoints, you can see them on the right. So suppose you want to fill this UI with all the data from your REST API. How would that work? Well, at first, you're going to start getting some basic product information in there. It will be your first request, right? So you're going to have the product information in there, like a title and a price, and you want to display them in your UI. And then maybe you want to show some breadcrumbs, want to show cat categories which the product is in. It will cost you another API call and you will get the category information and you will place it on this UI. And you can do the same for your reviews, right? So maybe you want to show the average amount of stars, maybe you want to see the total number of reviews. It will take you an extra API call. So these are three API calls I need to do just to fill a simple UI. And this is based on strict REST because some REST APIs aren't actually uh, based upon the very strict REST principles. But if they are, then they follow this principle. Every data source will have his own data structure and his own endpoint. So that always makes me think, can't this be done better? Is there no other way to actually help me with this? So you go to the principle, we want a GraphQL API, and we probably want it now because I'm going to start a new project. I need to make three requests to a REST API to fill my UI. That's something I want to prevent. I probably don't want the situation because more endpoints, it's going to take some more latency, it's going to take more time to load my page, and it's something you usually try to avoid, especially as a front-end developer, uh, where you want to stuff to be most performant as well, and also as a back-end developer, because, I don't know, why would you be making something that's based on a REST API, which is a principle from like 15 years ago? But probably still your product manager or the one with your project is going to say, nah, we don't have resources, we already have a REST API, or we have a REST API that's been worked on a lot, or maybe you don't have the knowledge about GraphQL, so that could be things you're, um, you're experiencing in this project. So you will just continue as, in my opinion, the very brave developer you are, because REST has a lot of downsides, and maybe some of them will tackle you later on in this project. So again, we have this UI with the three different endpoints, and as you can see, it will fill this simple UI. So those three endpoints, 
And if you look back at what the REST API is, uh, it is the multiple endpoints, which we just saw, but it also has fixed data structure. So basically, this means that every endpoint will have its own fixed data structure. And whatever you'll do, this endpoint will always return this exact data structure. So here's our REST API again. So we have three requests, one for like a basic information, one for categories, and also one with review information. And every, each one of these requests, it will return a file. And in this scenario, it would be a JSON file, a JSON format. So it can be a really big object like this, or maybe this is still small, and it can be even like three times bigger, or maybe even more. So this is just my first endpoint. And based on my UI, I'll probably will only use the, these fields. So I have this very big request, it returns a lot of data, and I'm only using four fields. So maybe that's something that should make some alarm lights going off on your desk, or maybe it won't, I'm not sure. So suppose you want to get a category information as well. Again, it could be like an endpoint uh, that returns a JSON object that's very big. Maybe it's even bigger than a product because it has more information about the product categories and maybe other more related information. And again, we're just using two small fields. So maybe you already start thinking, this is not my best solution for this, uh, to fill this UI, but yeah, you just continue. And then it will be a third request, and it will also return the same size of JSON object. So three requests returning very big uh, JSON objects, and it will take time to load in the browser, maybe you're working with Internet Explorer browsers, or maybe something we have the city of Amsterdam, it's a big problem. Uh, everyone that works for the city of Amsterdam has a dedicated desktop computer, and they have this uh, work environment on there, and every time you load over like 50 Mbit in a browser, it's gonna crash, because it's running out of memory. So suppose you have all these endpoints and they're getting these big JSON objects, they've all been put in like the memory of your browser, at some point you're gonna have some problems with it. So again, this is the REST API, and then you want to fill the UI. So you can imagine all this data flowing into your application. So like I said, with the, maybe with the very slow old browsers, you can run into problems, because if you hit memory limits, stuff is gonna get, um, it's gonna get slower. So again, you probably start asking for a, REST, for a GraphQL API, right? Because you now experience the multiple endpoints, it can reduce your performance. It also isn't very developer friendly, because you need to tie all this data together. And also you saw, if you're getting all this data into your application that you actually aren't gonna use. So why would you work with a REST API that's gonna have a lot of different endpoints for you with a lot of data that you're not gonna use? So it sounds like a lot of disadvantages. But still, it can be hard to convince all the managers about what to do, right? Because they're thinking about time, money, resources, and maybe you're not even gonna maintain the project later on. And also migrating can be very expensive or time consuming. So probably managers will try and stop you from getting the GraphQL API and just want you to work with the REST API. So what would you do? There are multiple scenarios of stuff you can do over here right now. Because I made a small list of stuff you could do. You could just like sit down wondering, maybe quit your job, maybe just continue, or maybe, I don't know, just get really frustrated like the guy on the left. Or maybe you're gonna start putting a big riot in your company. You're gonna get really angry at your team, angry at your manager, angry at all your customers, and then at the end you still quit your job. Or maybe they will quit the project. It might be not that bad after all. Or like scenario C, you're gonna find a different solution. So in general, I'm more of the riot guy, so I probably would make all the riot and then do, go for C. But we would go for A. Just like do nothing, quit the job, and oh, you're all very brave. That's good to see. So we will actually start rioting and making, no, I'm the only one? Oh, some people. Ah, oh, you're maybe even more brave than the people just continuing. But we would find a different solution. And people that didn't raise their hand, they're going, just gonna do nothing, or? <laughs> yeah, so for the sake of this talk, we're gonna go for C, yeah? because we want to find a different solution. Usually, it's very hard to quit a project once you've invested a lot of time in it, so writing can be nice, and sometimes it works, but in the end, you probably still need to make a different solution to a problem. So we're gonna wrap our GraphQL outside of a REST application. We're gonna find a different solution to the problem we had. And there are actually a lot of, multi, a lot of options you have, because uh, there are front-end packages to help you with this, which aren't actually solving your problems because you still have multiple endpoints, multiple requests, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you're of also, you can go for like different solutions. There are online tools to help you wrap uh, REST APIs, but yeah, we can't discuss all. So these are some advantages, some options you have. 
uh, but there are always more options. And probably after this talk, you can ask me what the other options are. And one thing I actually like to do is create your own GraphQL server. And you don't have to be a backend developer to do this because it's all very simple, intuitive, and it doesn't take that much work. But if you are a backend developer, there's a lot of extra stuff you can put in there, which I'll discuss later. And yeah, so creating your own GraphQL server is easier than you might think. Because there are all those packages helping you with this, and yeah, so th there's one basic thing you need to think before you're actually making your API is, is my REST API the best solution to build on top of? And that all depends on your schema. So if you're not that familiar with GraphQL, um, instead of data sources, you're thinking about schemas. So a schema would be a projection of maybe what your data would look like, what kind of fields it have, or maybe the relationship between your different data, data fields. So if you want to construct a schema for a REST API, you don't have that much to choose. Like it's the same when you start creating uh, an API on top of a database. You're probably, your schema is related to, your, uh, to, all the tables, uh, to all the tables you have. So all the tables and the columns would be your fields. That's probably the data relations you already have. So in this case, when you construct a GraphQL schema on top of a REST API, uh, you have the same kind of stuff to work with. So as you can see on the left, we will have our API endpoints over there, which are products and the categories and the ratings. And when you construct your schema, you'll probably take this over. So products are going to be uh, one type, your category is going to be a different type, and maybe the reviews will be a different type as well. So a schema will look like this. If you look on the left, we are defining types. Um, we have some IDs, and those IDs, they, have, uh, they also have their own type. So in this case, they are either a string, or maybe they're an integer, or maybe they're a relation to a different, they can be a relation to a different type as well. So if you're not familiar with GraphQL, but you have been using TypeScript, then probably this doesn't look too strange to you. Because you already know how to define how objects look like, what kind of fields they have, and what kind of types those fields have. So on the left, you can see I've created one for product, and product will have relationships with other things as well. So my product one, it's linked to all the information in the REST API, probably for my product endpoint, and you can see I also cut out a lot of fields. So I'm not going to use that entire JSON object. I selected which fields I want to use and which fields I don't want to use. And I did the same thing for category. And as you can see, it's, uh, the category type is placed in array brackets over here. So it basically means it returns an array of the category type. If you look uh, just below the type of the product, you can see I have a category type defined and it just returns a title because the title is the only thing I'm displaying in my, in my user interface. And you can see it's like a one-to-many relationship. So my product can have multiple categories, and all those categories will have their own title. And I did the same for the review as well. So for the review information, I'm going to return the count, which is like the total number of reviews, and also the review average. So this is information I want to display on my UI, so I'm putting all this stuff in my schema. And the nice thing is you can also rename them later on if you do extra stuff in your resolvers, but I'll show you that later on. So I created a small code sandbox with, uh, with the code for this. So you take a picture of this one, you can find the, the code in the code sandbox and try it yourself. I will put it later on on my Twitter as well, so you can find it there uh, to play with at home. I'm not sure how mobile-friendly code sandbox is, but you can always try. So I can also show you what it looks like. So in this scenario, I still need to get used to like the touchpad for Mac. It's, I believe it's like this. Yeah, so this is my shortcut to get to mirroring. Okay, let me. Yeah, so this is what the code looks like. So this is a code sandbox instance. And if I zoom in a bit, I think it's big enough. Yeah, so I installed some packages, some Node.js, some Node packages like Express and GraphQL HTTP, which is also middleware for GraphQL to work with Express. And I just created something based on top, of, um, on top of a REST API that I created with Mockable. If you don't know Mockable, it's really great, and you can create your own REST APIs with it. They're especially handy if you don't have a backend yet. So you can play around with making the request and all, and making all the services for that. And I constructed my schema, as you see in here, I just my product. I've put in an ID, a title, a thumbnail, price, categories, all the information to display in your UI. And this is just a schema you saw on the big screen just before. And I just put it in code here in this code sandbox. 
And then I have resolvers, and this is where the actual magic is happening and where you tie all the data together. I'll get into some more detail about those later. And in the end, I'm just tying everything together, and something that's really nice and comes with uh, GraphQL server, if you edit, I edit it right here, is the Express, Express Playground. And this will help you getting a visual interface of all your, uh, of your, not all your endpoints, because you just have one in GraphQL, of your GraphQL endpoint. And this is something you can see right here. Yeah, so this is the visual uh, GraphQL playground interface, which you have over here. And in here, you can just explore your GraphQL API, and in here, you can just look at your schema again. So my schema is defined over here as well. You can download it, send it to wherever you want it to be, maybe your mother, because you're really proud of the nice schema you made. And you can also look at your queries. And as you look on the left, I created my query right here, and all the information there. So it's nothing too much in its code per sandbox, but it's a really nice example to get started with. So let me try this hotkey. Ah, nice. Yeah, so here's the code again from this very small example. Um, and like I said before, the actual magic is in the resolvers, because resolvers is where we're gonna um, attach your REST API to our GraphQL server. And so if we look at our UI again, uh, you can see the resolvers on the right, and in my resolvers, I'm creating the connection between the REST API and my actual GraphQL schema. So my schema is gonna define what will be in my UI, and the endpoints are gonna deliver the data for that. And my resolver, I'll tie everything nicely together. And as you can see, to fill my UI, I need to get some gather some data from my REST API, right? So one of the things I need to do is get my product information just by sending a fetch request to uh, that REST API endpoint. And the same if I want to show the category information, and the same if I want to show the reviews. And in the end, you can see I'm returning an object, and it will contain all this information tied together. So basically, instead of using all those endpoints in my front end, I replace this logic to the back end, where I'm parsing all this data, and I'm going to return one object that will be matching my schema. And this will require me to send uh, a query to my GraphQL server, which will look like this. It already looks way cleaner than sending three different fetch requests, right? So as you can see, it's a query, and it will give me all this information I want. As you can see, I'm getting product, and this specific product I'm trying to show here is apparently the ID number three, and it will have a title, a thumbnail, the price, some category information, and reviews as well. So I gathered all this information from my REST API using the GraphQL server, and that's done using the resolvers. So basically, the resolvers are the magic link between the, API, the REST API you have, and maybe it is not the REST API that's your data source, it can also be a database. Especially if you're using a document-based database like MongoDB, it works really well together with GraphQL because you already have the same sort of objects and relationships, but it can also work with MySQL or Postgres or any other relational database you have out there. And probably you think that's very easy, right? I just create some extra server, I'm gonna wrap all those endpoints in there, construct them together, make a schema, and send queries to it. That's sort of the short summary of what I just did. But it comes with multiple challenges, because you're still sending three different requests to the endpoints. And we haven't talked about other stuff like authentication as well. So basically, I don't have that much time, so basically I want to do both subjects. Uh, but for today, I chose to go for authentication. So caching is also something that's really interesting because you're sending three different requests to the endpoints, and maybe you want to cache that information uh, just so you won't have to send requests to those endpoints every time, because probably your category information won't change that often, and probably your product prices and stuff like that won't change that often as well. So maybe you can, uh, you can cache a lot of stuff out there to make the server more performant for you. But suppose you want to know more about authentication. Um, because that's also something we haven't, we haven't used, and some REST APIs have authentication, some don't have any, and there are a lot of ways to actually um, confront this, this problem. And to me, when I work with Node.js and work with GraphQL, I always like JSON Web Tokens. And is everyone familiar with JSON Web Tokens? Ah, so a lot of people are, that's good to see. Probably a lot of projects you're using every day are using JSON Web Tokens. If you ever inspect uh, like the local storage or session storage in your browser when you open up maybe Facebook or maybe any, any other application you use every day, you probably see a lot of encoded uh, tokens in there, and one of them might even be a JSON Web Token. So in short, the JSON Web Token is 
just a very small basic token which you can see on the, uh, on the left side uh, once it's encoded. It's just a lot of gibberish, you don't really know what's seeing there, and you can decode it. And to decode it, you just need uh, to know which data algorithm you used, and also uh, what's your JWT secret, which salts it all up and uh, makes it a bit harder to read, but still. Uh, JWT tokens are actually more of a transaction token between your browser or your mobile application and your backend. And because they are pretty easily uh, decoded, you should never put any private information in there. Because if you look there, I just put my name in there, probably like a user ID and an expiration date. And this expiration date will uh, let my server know whether or not the user is still allowed to get the information. And probably when you send a new request, you're going to send a new token every time. So how will this kind of tokens work? So again, we have this UI we filled, and we have the GraphQL API that wraps the REST API, which you can see on the right. And to get a safe connection between them, we want to use JWT tokens. So probably what will happen, you will send uh, a request to your server, and maybe your REST API is handling, maybe not. But let's send a request, and we're gonna ask for, uh, we're gonna send some login details over there. And your server is gonna handle it and probably it's already inside your REST API, and if it's not, we'll look at a solution for that later on. So you're gonna send the request, and once all the details are valid, you've got a, maybe a username and a password, uh, my software will turn a JWT token. And this token, I can store it, and with every request I'm sending, I'm sending my JWT token to the server as well. And it's probably just gonna look for an expiration date, so maybe you need to log in again, and a lot of times what will happen, uh, the API will only return data once the JWT token is valid. So once I send a valid token in there, um, it will return the data, and a lot of times it will also return a new token. So I've got a new token with a new expiration date, that way you won't ask your users to log in every 30 minutes or whatever. Yeah, so like I said, they're passed with every request. So this is the GraphQL playground again, and something I can do in here is sending a token information with my request. So whenever I put something in the HTTP headers, I'm sending this to my server, and my GraphQL server can do uh, something with it. It can either parse it himself, or maybe redistribute it to the REST API, or maybe reduce it to the authentication server. It's all done in there. And as you can see, it starts with bearer, which is actually the way you start a JWT token. So if you're gonna start uh, destructuring this, make sure to get the bearer out there, because you just need uh, the encoded information. And if you looked at what I said before, or maybe not even looked, but probably mostly listened, then you probably know about the resolvers. And the resolvers is where all the magic was happening, where we connect our REST APIs um, with the GraphQL API and our schema. So if you want to do something, um, if you want to do something with our REST APIs here, maybe pass header information to it, it should be done over here, because here we're sending a fetch request, and in here we can also get the token information uh, from our GraphQL request. So using GraphQL Playground, I showed you before, you can send a token, and then it will be received by a GraphQL server, and it will end up in your resolvers. And because in your resolvers, you can actually access the request headers and get the token information out there. And once you have the token information, you can just pass it along with the fetch function, uh, which will look something like this. And this is in a scenario your REST API already has authentication. So we're gonna just gonna assume JWT tokens are already applied to your REST API and you're just passing along the information. So if this is your scenario, it's really easy to build a GraphQL server on top because you don't need to handle authentication, you ju would just need to handle caching to make this work very well for you. But maybe there are some scenarios where your REST API is only available internally, maybe within the own network and you want to build something on top. Or maybe not all the endpoints in your REST server have been encrypted yet or have been uh, requested authorization stuff. That could be the deal, right? So in this scenario, there are also multiple things you can do because that's the nice thing about programming. There are always like 100 solutions to your problem. Uh, I can't discuss all, unfortunately, but one thing you can do is use an authentication server. So again, you would have your uh, application, you would have your GraphQL slash REST API, and you're gonna send a login request to it. And as your API doesn't have any authentication, you would need an authentication server. And for this, you can use something like Out0, and there are alternatives as well, and you can also build your own one, which is pretty neat, but it requires some extra, some extra programming. Okay, so suppose you have this Out0 authentication server, um, you're sending a login request to your API, and it will need to get your JWT token from somewhere, right? 
So it will send a request to the authentication server, which will return your JWT token, which you can then pass back to your application. So it just added a different step, so you don't have to apply any authentication logic anywhere. You would just have an authentication server uh, set up using out zero, and it will work the same way, right? So in this scenario, you're sending uh, a request to your GraphQL server. Together with your REST API, it will send some information to OutZero and it will return a JWT token. It will also ma magically verify if it's correct or not. And if it is, it returns the data to you. So this is a very simple step to authentication without that much programming. Uh, but like I said before, it's also possible to create your own one. And in that scenario, you won't have any vendor lock-ins, you won't have to pay like monthly fees, just maybe for wherever your server is hosted. So in case you want to create your own one, there's this nice NPM package, and let's hope it isn't corrupted or putting uh, cryptocurrency uh, loaders in your browser. Probably not. But you can use this JSON Web Token package to uh, encode and decode JWTs. So if we look at this picture again, on the, right, on the left you can see an encoded JWT token, and on the right you can see what it decodes to. Um, and this is something you can do using that J JSON Web Token package. So you can just build your own authentication server and have all the logic for encoding and decoding the information from the user and the JDBT token in there. And it will just be like this very simple uh, methods available like the sign one. It will help you uh, putting the payload from the user inside the JDBT token. And also it can help you with verifying once you receive a token whether or not you can use it. So this is a solution you can create your own and it isn't that hard to make one because it's just an extra step and maybe you can also already build it in your resolvers because that's a place where you could put logic like this. But then you would have to think about how you're actually doing this and whether or not you want the logic to be in that same, uh, in that same API. So probably and hopefully you all want to pick it, you wrap all your REST APIs inside GraphQL APIs. And yeah, so what do you want? Probably a GraphQL API because that's something I'm trying to get with every project. And probably what you want your users to have, uh, and in the end your product manager just to say, uh, just create me that GraphQL server, because that would be great. It can help you with a lot, of diff a lot of problems you might have. And also, as we just saw, it isn't that hard to set up one. So that was most of my talk. You can find me on Twitter if you have any questions, or find my, um, my videos on YouTube as well. If you just search for my name, there will be lots of content, mostly about GraphQL or React or whatever kind of uh, JavaScript problems you have. And also, I'll be at some other conferences next month. So if you happen to be around, just let me know, and maybe we can meet over there. Thank you.